All right. So yeah, let's uh, officially start the webinar. Um, I'll uh, just um, give a, a, a brief introduction to start with. So my name is Philip Heitbrink. I'm the CEO of SciLife. And with me today, we have Carmen Doran from Helios, uh, all the way in New Zealand. So quite a few kilometers and time zones away. So thank you for being here. For me, it's a morning. For you, it's 12 hours later <laughs> in mm -hmm. the evening. So uh, same time, uh, yeah, a completely different uh, time in the day. So Doran, uh, uh, um, Carmen, maybe you can introduce yourself to explain a little bit to the audience who you are, where you come from, what you've been up to the past years. Sure. So kia ora or good morning from New Zealand to all of those joining us in Europe. Um, a bit about me. So my name is Carmen Doran and I'm the CEO of Helios Therapeutics. I joined Helios two years ago, first as the Chief Operating Officer and then became CEO at the beginning of last year. Uh, a little bit about my background. So I am from New Zealand originally. I grew up in the home of bungee jumping. So those that may have visited New Zealand in their lifetime may have been to or have heard of Queenstown, the home of adventure. And that was my playground as a child and growing up. Uh, I have a master's degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. And then like many New Zealanders, I headed off overseas uh, on my big OE, overseas experience, uh, planning to be away for one year to travel Europe and see the world. Uh, as Philip has said, New Zealand is a long way from the rest of the world. So when we tend to go on holiday, we need to do it in a big way. Uh, so I went overseas with a plan of being away for one year and traveling through Europe, uh, but life had other plans for me. And I spent 10 years overseas working for Novartis Pharmaceuticals, uh, one of the larger pharma companies in the world. So I started my journey at Novartis in Horsham in the UK, which is near Gatwick Airport. And that was a site where we were producing solid dosage forms. And I was production team manager, managing the overall value stream from material in the door, through manufacturing, through the packaging process and through distribution and quality control on the way out. Um, after three years there in the UK, I was looking for a new challenge at the same time as Novartis was building a brand new site in Singapore. So one time on my way back to the UK after being at home in New Zealand for Christmas, I detoured via Singapore to see how the progress was going. And two weeks later, I ended up back in Singapore as a part of the engineering team in a greenfield site there. When I first arrived in Singapore, we had a concrete shell, we had compression tableting machines sitting in the car park under plastic and lizards running through the corridor. And a year and a half later, we had installed and commissioned and qualified all of that equipment, uh, the systems and processes we needed for safety, for manufacturing, for quality. We had recruited 200 people from all across Asia and we had all of our licenses and started supplying both into Japan and into the USA. So that was a great opportunity in terms of building a site and ramping it up. Uh, at the same time, I also completed my Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, traveling to and from our head office in Basel, Switzerland to complete the training for that. Uh, so my next step in my Novartis journey was head of global operational excellence for Novartis, uh, covering 24 sites in 22 countries with a real purpose of best practice, sharing, uh, troubleshooting, improving processes, and upskilling the capability around the world around lean methodologies. So I got involved in all sorts of different processes, saw some great examples around the world. Um, but after five years of hotels and planes, it was time to get back into a site. Uh, so I moved back into our largest site, which was in Stein in Switzerland where we were launching highly active products. And then the last part of my Novartis journey was in as head of operations for the UK for Novartis Animal Health. And the reason why that's important is we talk about the Helios journey as an 
at Helios, we develop and produce medicinal cannabis products for humans and for animals. So it's nice to have that experience there. So after my one year overseas, that became 10 years traveling the world, I came back home to New Zealand uh, with the goal of moving into consulting. I thought about it for a while and thought now is the time to do that. The first response was, you can't do consulting from New Zealand. It's too far oh, yeah. away. <laughs> and uh, the second part was, and you definitely can't do it from Queenstown. So the plan was that we would give it six months and if that didn't work, I would get a real job. Uh, but actually I consulted for five years from Queenstown, New Zealand, traveling still across New Zealand, as well as around the world, helping out uh, companies in the regulated industries and in implementing change. So whether that was new systems, new processes, cultural change, new technology, that was kind of my sweet spot for consulting. And that's how I ended up at Helios. Uh, I went in and was invited as a consultant to go and talk to them about their processes. And uh, I went in to pitch my services and walked out with a job. So I'm not sure if that makes me really good at pitching my services or really bad, <laughs> um, but that's how I ended up at Helios Therapeutics. And uh, as luck would have it, the next week, the global pandemic rolled out and I wasn't able to travel to my clients around the world. So it was really perfect timing to be working with the team at Helios here in New Zealand in the sunrise industry that we are working in. Absolutely. Yeah, so perfect timing indeed. Um... So I also noticed that you that you mentioned Stein uh, Novartis. <clears throat> so what what year was that that you were the the, the last uh, year that you were there? Is that a long time ago? No, so I came back to New Zealand at the end of 2014 after a year okay. in Scotland. So it was probably yeah 2012 maybe. Okay, okay, no, yeah, that was 2012, 2013, maybe around then. Yeah, because Novartis Stein was the first site that we onboarded in one of our modules in, in SciLife. So I thought, okay, mm -hmm. maybe you were there while I was traveling there too. But then Everyone is connected in the pharmaceutical yeah, world, somehow. right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so yeah, thank you for the introduction, uh, Carmen. Um, so this is also the structure of the webinar. Uh, we will uh, yeah, finish the introduction in a, in, a, in a minute. Then we will go to the main section of the webinar. Um, where, yeah, with Carmen today, we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of being the first, uh, among other things, right? Because in, in New Zealand, the legislation for medicinal cannabis was just, uh, yeah, uh, recently passed. So um, uh, we were thinking that being the first can mean a, a huge effort, but can also somehow pave the way for competitors uh, to, to be fast followers. So uh, fast followers is sometimes even a bigger advantage than being being the first. So um, yeah, I'm just curious to know how Helios' uh, experience was and how you guys tackled this to to keep ahead of of the rest. Um, anyway, let's not uh, discuss that too much yet. The the third section of the webinar uh, are Q and A. That doesn't mean that you have to wait with posting your questions. The the way it works is that in the Zoom bar that you have. There is a Q&A uh, section that you can click and you can just post all the, uh, the questions that you uh, would like to get answered somehow throughout the webinar. We will pick this up. We will, we will check this. Uh, I'll keep an eye on it. And I'll also ask the questions during the webinar or at the end during the Q&A session. So we will try to have 10 minutes, 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. But definitely don't wait to post your questions until the end, because otherwise uh, I won't know uh, how many questions we have from you. Um, so that would help us. All right. Um, I think that with that, we can uh, just kick it off uh, with the main section of the webinar, shall we, Carmen? Yeah, let's do it. Perfect. So um, I'll be running through the slides. Uh, and yeah, Carmen, maybe you can start with the purpose and the strategy. So for us at Helios, we want to unleash the potential of cannabis to improve quality of life. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about some of the ways that cannabis does improve quality of life. But for me, as CEO, that's one of my favorite parts of the day is getting those 
feedbacks through from our patients where they're able to go out and do something that they weren't able to do before they were on medicinal cannabis. Um, it really comes down to innovation. Uh, so we have a big focus on R&D. We have a big focus on collaboration and we're looking to create the world's safest and most efficacious cannabis medicines. So we're looking to create medicines that are not only safe, but safer than some of the alternatives and really focusing on those next generation natural medicines as a perfect um, solution to a lot of the world. And cannabis is a old medicine, but it's also a new medicine. Um, it's got a stigma around it. And with me coming from the pharmaceutical industry, I will be the first to admit that some of my first reactions about New Zealand having a medicinal cannabis industry uh, were not as positive as what the support that I have now for medicinal cannabis as an industry. Uh, and that's because I've really focused on learning how medicinal cannabis works with the body. So I think that really those next generation natural medicines are a step forward from the pharmaceutical industry and where we've been in the past. Next slide, okay. please. So a little bit about Helios. So Helios was founded in 2018. Uh, one of our founders famously jokes that it was founded in his back bedroom as an idea. Um, and very quickly, they found a very supportive investor who came on board because he was passionate about the health and well-being of New Zealanders. We are New Zealand's largest integrated cannabinoid pharmaceuticals company. So when we talk about integrated, that means we go right from growing the plant, we extract the cannabinoids and the terpenes from the plant, as well as making those finished dosage forms. And we have our own GMP laboratories on site as well. And as I said before, we have a big focus on innovation, working both with our own dedicated R&D lab, as well as partnering uh, through a number of collaborations and innovation. Uh, we're located in Auckland, which is at the top part of New Zealand in East Tamaki. Um, so Auckland is New Zealand's largest city, but New Zealand in itself is a lot smaller than some of the numbers you'll be used to in Europe. So New Zealand, we have 5 million people and we are located in the south of the largest city. Uh, this is our site that you can see here. It is an 8,800 square meter site. And actually, if you see the part that has the stripes across the roof, most of that is the cultivation facility. And then if you look where you've got the circle in the middle, that's the middle atrium of our building. To the left of that are our R&D and analytical labs upstairs, our extraction facilities downstairs, as well as production. And to the right of that, we have our offices. So it's a pretty significant site. Uh, we also have space inside that site to continue expanding our operations. So, so Carmen, the, um, I mean, you're all, uh, almost four years in business now. Did you guys start immediately at this facility or you somehow uh, sp started smaller and transitioned to this later uh, in, the, in the whole journey? What, what was, uh, how did, did the start look um, in your case? Yeah, so, so when I say we were founded in 2018, that's when the idea was born. Uh, mm -hmm. We secured these premises in 2019. And actually what okay. you see, like I said, that part with the stripy part on the roof, um, what we've done is we've built a factory inside a big warehouse uh, so that we have both our cultivation rooms as well as all of our HVAC and feeding systems are built inside that facility. So yes, we started already big, but inside that facility, the very first plants that were grown were grown inside a small research pod in the corner while we were continuing to do the construction. And the construction of the facility was completed at the end of 2020. Uh, okay, so it, yeah, okay. You were, you were uh, growing already, cultivating and uh, starting the business while the, the construction was going on. That's basically how you, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Um, yeah, let's continue with the, with the journey and the value chain. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, so we've spoken through a little bit of this already. So 2019 was when we first moved into those premises. 
And at the end of 2020 was when our construction was complete. Uh, even at that stage, we did need to have some licenses to be able to grow those medicinal cannabis plants inside of our facility. But where licensing really started to come in was through 2020 and 2021. So 2021 for us has been a focus on entering the domestic market, the New Zealand market. Uh, and as we said at the beginning of the webinar, Helios was the first to obtain the GMP license to manufacture medicines. We were also the first to enter the New Zealand market in 2021. And now in 2022, our focus is on export. So we take the processes that we've road tested in the New Zealand market, and we use them as a basis as we really ramp up for export and go to scale. Mm -hmm. what, so you're mentioning domestic uh, markets versus international markets. Um, what's, what's the difference uh, really? So the New Zealand market is still very new. So our legislation was passed in 2020. It came into act on April 2020, but there was an 18 month transition period. So prior to the medicinal cannabis scheme starting in New Zealand, patients were able to access uh, medicinal cannabis through special schemes, but they needed to go through quite a number of steps together with their prescriber to do that. So 2020 was when the regulations first came in, but the transition period ended on the 1st of October in 2021. And so when I say the domestic market, it is focusing on that New Zealand market. Now we only have 5 million people in New Zealand. There's still, it's still seen as a relatively new medicine in New Zealand. We're still breaking down some stigma around it as a medicine. And a lot of doctors that we talk to actually were never taught about medicinal cannabis as part of their training because the endocannabinoid system with which the medicinal cannabis works together with was only discovered around 30 years ago. So if you did your medicines training before that, you didn't even know how this could interact and work with the body. So there are definitely some skeptics out there but what we've done is we've put in place a full educational program for the industry where we really support healthcare professionals to learn about the endocannabinoid system and the mechanisms by which medicinal cannabis works. And um, so that's been part of that focus there. Now, New Zealand with only having 5 million people is never going to be enough to sustain a factory as big as what you've seen there. And in New Zealand, a lot of our businesses are very much focused on export to be able to deliver high quality New Zealand products to the world at the same time as giving those opportunities to New Zealand patients too. Okay, which export markets are you currently focused on and, and what, what are the priorities in that sense? Yeah, so the GMP license to manufacture medicines issued by our New Zealand Ministry of Health is mutually recognized as EU mm -hmm. GMP which means that opens up a number of markets around the world, uh, but especially into Europe, where some of the medicinal cannabis schemes have been in place for a few more years than what they have been in New Zealand. And some of those larger markets that we do see, um, Germany is the largest medicinal cannabis market in the world, uh, followed by Israel. Now, Israel is a much smaller country, but they've been doing research into cannabis for a very long time and have some of the forefathers into cannabis research located at universities in Israel. Okay. The, the other thing that comes to mind, if I look at this, right, you start, the idea starts in 2018, then you, you, you start to, to build the, the company and, and the factory 2019, but the legislation wasn't passed yet. So how yeah. do you, how do you execute this, this whole phased strategy with this big, uh, uh, unknown right which is yeah uh -huh. maybe the legislation maybe it, it still takes five years and uh -huh. you, you're doing this huge investment uh, of, of, with the factory and with the research um, without really knowing when the legislation will be passed to actually uh -huh. bring your product to market so how, how do you plan for that yeah so I guess some of the legislation we were able to see what was happening around the world and make some educated guesses or understandings as to what okay. our New Zealand legislation would look like, but absolutely there were risks taken. And I think that for me, having come from a much 
larger and potentially more stable environment for, in startup world, um, a key part of this is knowing that you don't always have all of the answers. Mm. And medicinal cannabis is really, really interesting like that in the fact that we bring, I bring my experience from a pharmaceutical world. We've brought in talent also from the North American market where they're producing cannabis for a more wellness or recreational world, but are not so used to a high level of regulations. And we've had to meld that really together. So we didn't know exactly what we were coming up against with legislations when this, the company was founded, but we were working together with government departments. We had an insight into that. Um, and we got probably 95% of it right. There's a few things that we've had to change in the construction of the facility. So there are risks that are taken by, by doing that early, but being able to do that early and have those first mover advantages was the key. Okay, and uh, so you were looking at other countries to figure out um, more or less how the legislation was passed there, how long it took, etc. So mm -hmm. which countries were already in the market with le with past legislation? So yeah. how uh, uh, in, in the whole list of countries, because it, it, take, it takes this time for other mm -hmm. countries to just follow suit. So yeah. which countries would be the first and where would New Zealand score more or less in that? Uh, yeah, I'm curious to know. Yeah, so, so we talk about the first. So New Zealand is the first to see every single day. So we're used to being the first on some things, but we were not the first in the medicinal cannabis uh, markets. I've spoken about Germany, I've spoken about Israel, also our neighbours over the ditch in Australia were a couple of years ahead of us as well. So we looked to all okay. of those to see what their regulation and what the regulatory environment would look like. Um, also, a number of the regulations we're working to are not necessarily specific to only medicinal cannabis. Uh, the GMP license to manufacture medicines is the same license as anyone manufacturing medicines would use. So those rules are the same, the audits are the same. Um, so we're not dealing with a completely brand new set of legislations. We're able to utilize some of our skills and experience in the GMP world to transition that across. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, um, just for the audience, uh, as a short reminder, uh, feel free to post questions, right? I'm, otherwise, I'm just shooting my questions constantly to Carmen. So feel free to just post them in the chat or preferably in the in the Q&A section in the Zoom bar, you can click on uh, on the button and just post your questions there if you have any already. Um, and I, yeah, let's I've just had a quick, just, quick look at the participants list and there's a few names that I recognize from my former life, so... I'm sure there'll be some questions. There we go. Dorothea is um, popping up to say she's got to go, but nice to okay. see you, Dorothea. Nice. Thank you very much for coming on. This is also a recorded webinar, so you can always um, watch it back later if you if you cannot stay for the for the whole we uh, webinar. I do see a, a question coming in from I just see Kay. Uh, I don't know the the, full, the, the name, but that's fine. Uh, who is the company that offer this type of GMP certification and, and where is it? Maybe that's mm -hmm. already an interesting question. Yeah, so our Helios GMP license to manufacture medicines is issued by MedSafe, which is one of the departments of the New Zealand Ministry of Health. So it's a government, um, a government agency that issues our GMP license to manufacture medicines, which is also mutually recognized through that, uh, that scheme into... Europe, but also into a number of other countries around the world. Okay, thank you, Mr. or Ms. K. I hope that um, answers your question. If not, just uh, post a follow-up question. That's totally fine. Anyway, let's uh, move on with a business overview and, and some updates about Helios. Please, Carmen. Yeah, so um, we are vertically integrated. We start from the beginning of the process, right from seeds or from clones, which are baby, baby plants about this big, uh, through the growing process, the drying process, uh, through the extraction and manufacturing of bulk, and then through to final finished packs. And I think that's really exciting, especially with my background in lean manufacturing, to be able to have that entire value stream all under one roof um, and to be producing to the high standards that we are producing. Mm -hmm. What's the, what would be the difference between, uh, just for the audience to, to be totally clear on that, what's the difference between bulk and finished uh, mm -hmm. product? 
Yeah, so bulk was is the when you're mixing together the excipients or the ingredients together with the active ingredient, uh, the cannabinoids in this case. And then the finished product is the final packaging. So our first products to market are oral liquids. So they're packaged into individual bottles, which are then packaged into cartons and distributed through the networks to pharmacists. Okay, okay, that's clear. Okay. And this is a bit of an insight. I would love to take you all on a tour of the facility, um, but Absolutely. it's a bit far to come. So let me give a bit of an insight and also introduce you to a few of our team. So virtual if we tour. are a virtual tour, a virtual tour. Absolutely. So this is what you see under the roof of that building that I showed you earlier. And rather than starting at the beginning of the process, I'm gonna start at the end of the process and work backwards because that's actually okay. been the key to one of the reasons that we're able to have a first fast mover advantage is because we are building the value stream working backwards. Uh, so we set up our distribution processes, our quality control processes, and our formulation and packaging processes first using imported active ingredient. So that's a way of being able to road test all of those processes before adding on the extraction and purification process and the cultivation process as well. So building that value stream really working backwards was a key for having that fast and first mover advantage. Um, Teresa, our supply manager, smiling there next to a, a big box. She's the one that works with all of our customers and gets those wonderful feedbacks from people where they've had the best night's sleep since they've started on medicinal cannabis or they've been able to uh, move about and have a lot less pain since they've started on medicinal cannabis or they've been able to reduce their reliance on opioids, for example, as well. So she is fantastic at that. Um, and she also keeps everything ticking along and gets all of those products out to our distribution channels. If we step back our quality control process, so we have GMP labs on site. Uh, we're able to do the majority of the testing we need to, to release our products and also to be able to accelerate our R&D. Um, we also have now a partnership deal uh, for New Zealand grown CBD uh, so CBD is one of the types of cannabis to feed extraction for export, and we're able to do the quality control for that as well. If we move backwards through, so I spoke about the different parts around bulk manufacturing and packaging. So we do that formulation and packaging on site as well. This is Beth, our production manager. Um, Beth is one of those that jumped over to the dark side and jumped back. So she started her life in operations, she spent some time in quality and we've moved her back across to operations. Um, and so she manages all of that part and that experience, having been in pharmaceutical quality roles before is great as we're setting up the systems and processes. Uh, Matt, our extraction manager is one of the people who comes uh, that we imported. So Matt comes from the USA, from the North America cannabis market, where that market is not controlled to the same high level of quality standards that we do. It's a recreation and more of a wellness market. It also comes under different sets of regulations depending on which state you're in. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated over there in the US market as well. Uh, but having his expertise has been really great in setting up the processes. And for him, he's learnt going through and working together with people like Beth, the GMP insights uh, that are required to run and make medicines and produce them consistently every time. And right back to the start of our process. So cultivation is the start of our process. And we'll talk a little bit later about dosage forms, but cultivation can also be the end of our process for one of our dosage forms. So up into Europe, dried flour is still a high, has a high proportion of the dosage forms that are used in Germany. So that would be just that part of the value chain in terms of supplying that dried flour. Uh, and Kai is a, Kai or a Kaika is a third generation grower from Hawaii. So he's been around this plant his whole life. He's also worked in the commercial industry in the US before he moved over to New Zealand. Um, so he has a great insight and a great eye for the work that he's doing together with the plants and the cultivars. 
So uh, yeah, um, very interesting story and, 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 and process, Carmen. What what comes to mind is that you really have the yeah the, the full integration from from the mm -hmm. farming basically until the, the the production and the and the packaging and, and distribution right so um, you have very different skill sets uh, that you require in your company mm -hmm. how hard is it to combine really the, the the farming world with the pharma world have these skill sets within the company mm -hmm. and really everybody needs to have at some point this pharma mindset even even the mm -hmm. growers right so mm -hmm. how hard is it to to um, yeah to combine those two worlds within the same company for me it's one of the parts i love about the job that i have as a ceo is creating mm -hmm. that platform to combine to what can be very very different worlds you know growing something which is a biological asset a plant that in itself has variation um, even when you're using the same genetics, you can still have variation in plant to plant. And because we're making medicines, we're trying to control that as much as possible through to, you know, the white coats and the hair nets and the highly controlled um, pharmaceutical processes that people on this call are probably more familiar with. Mm -hmm. And for me, having been around pharmaceuticals a lot of my life, I'm used to having my active ingredient arrive, you know, in a container or in a drum ready to make the product, but we're actually growing our active ingredient. And the plant is so complex in terms of the number of different cannabinoids and the combinations of those cannabinoids, and then the therapeutic outputs or benefits that come, um, that there are so many things still for us to learn and to discover. Uh, the two major cannabinoids that we see are THC and CBD, but there are over a hundred minor cannabinoids also present in the plant and they're still learning about these uh, and that's before we get into the terpenes the smells the flavors of the plant which also have medicinal benefits and i think that that is a really fascinating um, clash of cultures but also a real opportunity it really brings together um, art and science it's a bit like making wine for example that i get idea of the bouquet of the growing conditions, of all of those things impacting the finished product, but we're making medicines. Yeah, absolutely. So also um, from, a, from a recruitment or a hiring perspective, um, the, the, the struggle that we have seen at SciLife, in the end, we're, we're a software company, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you need a lot of software developers, but the, uh, and then also customer success, business development. So you can hire, uh, these these skill sets, uh, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that have them, but do not have the experience in the pharma world or, or biotech or, or, or medical devices in our case. So there is a big difference between finding a person from the pharma world and educating them uh, into whatever, business development mm -hmm. or marketing, and, and they will get this skill set going or the other way around, right? Uh, or, or even developers finding developers and then having to teach them the the whole pharma regulation so that they understand how this product needs to comply because if the if the developer doesn't understand then it can even be built the wrong way so there was always this doubt do we try to find people and then narrow our search a lot that have already farm experience or do we just hire very good developers and good business developers and then teach them the pharma uh, regulatory uh, know-how that they need to have, right? So how, uh, what was your experience and, and what worked best for yeah. you? So as you've seen, as I've introduced you to some of our team, we've hired experts in their field. Uh, now that field may not cover all of the things that we need for medicinal cannabis. And that's partly because this as an industry is very new here in New Zealand. Um, I guess the key insight that I can let you into is the Helios values, which we hmm. developed at the beginning of last year. So the, Heli the team at Helios went through a process of redefining the Helios values. And one of them that really helps us in this world where no one is coming in as an expert in everything and everyone has something to learn is curiosity. 
which is one of the values that we have. And that gives people at absolute permission to put their hand up and say, I'm curious, why do you do that? Or what does that mean? Or how does this work? Um, and we actually, we don't have room or time for egos. We don't have, no one can be an expert in this yes, yet because it's too new. So everyone brings something with them, but everyone has something to learn. And I think that that's part of it is uh, the values together with the skill set that you bring. Yeah, as they say, experts are often people that can tell you exactly how stuff cannot be done, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you want to be, be careful with certain type of experts. Of course, you need to have a skill set, but yeah, yeah, there's a difference between uh, really being an expert. And, yeah, and all of us are learning every day. Yeah, all of us constantly. get to learn and that's great, right? Yeah. No matter what stage of your career you're at, at Helios, there's always things to learn. And we're a small team too. So we all help each other in different areas of the business. And mm -hmm. that's a great way to learn as well. Yeah. So how large is the team now, Carmen? Yeah. So we have 26 full-time employees at the moment, and we mm -hmm. will double in the next 12 to 18 months. So we're a small okay. team, but have ramped up quickly in the last year and will ramp up even faster as we go into export markets. And nice. so that's why as well, getting the foundation of the values and the way that we do things around here is so critical because that sets uh, the future life of the, the whole company. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, so yeah, let's continue. Yeah, I think there's just one question down the bottom. Yeah, let me, oh yeah, I see. Uh, actually, I see a few more coming in. So let me, maybe you can already explain this slide and I can, mm -hmm. I can, uh, Check we'll go back to those until, ones until the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we talked about quality of life as being part of our purpose, and actually, medicinal cannabis can be used across a real range of different areas. And um, around the world, there's over three billion people who are suffering from conditions that can be treated with medicinal cannabis. Okay. So so regarding the the health issues i know now now comes a slide which discusses all the different health issues that that can be treated with medicinal cannabis uh, but i'm really curious to know if the audience has a has a good idea of of all the health issues that that can actually be treated because uh there are quite a few um so i would like to ask some participation from the audience if I ask you, um, give me examples of health issues that can be treated with medicinal cannabis, what comes to mind? What do you know the, uh, for, for, for a fact that can be treated with uh, medicinal cannabis? So for people in the, in the call, uh, yeah, I'm just curious to know if, um, yeah, what, what, what health issues you can, you can come up with. So maybe you can just use the chat and post your answers in the chat. So which health issues can be treated with medicinal cannabis as far as you know? So um, just to have some participation from the people. Natasha says pain treatment. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Pain treatment would be uh, definitely one. Are there any other issues that come to mind uh, from anybody? back pain yeah that's uh yeah it's it's also a pain treatment i guess but yeah back pain makes sense for now we have pain right so uh stress amna mm -hmm. says st stress lena uh used against multi-resistant bacteria uh, a mm -hmm. combination therapy she mentions interesting um so we have pain we have stress and uh, multi-resistant bacteria. Okay, any other health issue that comes to mind from anybody? Okay, so um, neurodegenerative diseases, says Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so yeah, let's, uh, let's see what Carmen has to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> So go ahead. 
Yeah, so um, you said these are all of the conditions. These are just some of the conditions that medicinal cannabis can treat, um, that we know that there are trials completed or ongoing in these areas. And in some cases, there are registered pharmaceutical products as well. Um, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to talk through how all of these different treatments work, but I am an engineer. And I wanted to share with you the part that changed my mind around medicinal cannabis. And that was really learning about the endocannabinoid system or ECS that all of us have in our bodies. Uh, all mammals have this, so all humans, but also all mammals as well, which gives you an insight as to why we're developing medicines for animals at the same time as we're developing them for humans. Now the endocannabinoid system has receptors in the body and their main role is basically about maintaining homeostasis or balance. So that's how medicinal cannabis works. It's all about maintaining or restoring balance in your system. And so that's why it treats a real range of conditions. And a lot of these conditions are often, uh, you see them happen at the same time. So they're, they're coexisting conditions. We all know that if you've had a bad night's sleep, then if you need to do something the next day, you'll be more anxious about it. Or if you're in pain and you've had a bad night's sleep, then the pain gets worse. And then you get anxious because you've got the pain and so you can't do the things that you want, for example. And so all of these things really do coexist. And medicinal cannabis is about restoring the balance. Uh, one of the things that we are learning more about is the use of cannabinoids in cancer. And can, I think all of us on this call will have someone that we've interacted with that has been through cancer treatment that can actually be quite, quite tough on your body. And medicinal cannabis is being used in a number of cancer patients to reduce pain, to relieve nausea, to stimulate appetite, um, as well as the added benefits of sleep and reduced anxiety. And so we're exploring a few clinical pathways in this area uh, together with local partners. And, and what do, do these partnerships uh, look like? Are these, are these research teams uh, or, or what, what is the format? Yeah, so Helios Therapeutics, we have a research partnership with Auckland University of Technology, mm -hmm. which is a local university where we have three PhD students, one master's student and one honours student who are all working on projects um, around the use of medicinal cannabis. And that partnership gives us opportunities to develop our product pipeline for the future. And then it also gives us an opportunity to develop our talent pipeline as well. Absolutely, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. All right. Uh, so now we get into a, a little bit of the, the big words that are difficult to pronounce and why we use smaller acronyms like everywhere else in pharmaceuticals. Um, so THC and CBD are the two major cannabinoids which are found in the plant, but there are over a hundred minor cannabinoids present in the plant as well. Uh, the THC is the one that gets you high. It's the one that has psychoactive properties, um, but it also when used in the right dosage can provide a number of medical benefits as well. Whereas CBD is the one that uh, people probably, especially in a naive or a new market like New Zealand, uh, are much more comfortable starting off with. What mm. we're seeing is people are starting off with CBD and then moving to a more balanced formulation. Uh, the dosage form depends on what's needed for the patient. So if you need rapid onset or slow release, for example, but a number of these dosage forms are exactly the same as what we would see in a pharmaceutical setting. And here's some of them, so nothing too new there. The one that is probably a bit different from what you would see in a standard pharmaceutical setting is the dried flower. And that was what I was speaking about previously, that the value chain can start and end all with the cultivation part of the process. I and this is actually the most common format in Europe still. Hmm. Okay. So I, I, I think you mentioned that for now, all your products are liquid products. Yeah. So um, th 
the, the question would be why why are these mostly liquid uh, because mm -hmm. there are also all these other types of yeah um yeah. pills and, and capsules and etc so we chose to bring the liquid products to market first because there is already a um an understanding by physicians by uh, healthcare professionals around the use of this because that's the most common dose form that was already being used in a medical sense here in New Zealand. Uh, so it was a, a transition. It's also one of the easier options to manufacture. So if you start with the easier okay. ones and then you build up the complexity, that's another way of being able to go faster. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, market. Um... Mm -hmm. The grow, a fast growing market, you can definitely say so, right? Um, yep. Are we gonna we're gonna come back to the questions, Philip. I can see a few popping popping up, which yeah, is great because um, that means people are curious and they want to absolutely. learn. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, what are uh, Emna asks? What are your thoughts about using medicinal cannabis and its probable addiction effects afterwards? Mm -hmm. And I, so I think that around addiction, um, I would probably defer most of those questions to a healthcare professional uh, mm. to answer. But I think one of the key things is looking into the use of the CBD versus the THC, um, because it is the psychoactive part in the THC that people get potentially addicted to, though the studies do sometimes say that there are, it's, it is non-addictive. Uh, but when you take that together, with CBD, the CBD actually neutralizes some of those psychoactive benefits. So it really is about using the right medicine for the right thing. Um, and you'll see that we have a very much focus on cannabis as a medicine rather than as a recreational product. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, and then there are also uh, many other drugs that might have um, this 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 risk, right, of of. Mm -hmm being ad uh, addictive at some point so i think it's um it, it depends on the doctor and how it's monitoring the patient uh to make sure that this doesn't happen just yeah like and i think as well the the addictive properties of cannabis while there are some studies in that there are a lot more studies that cannabis is not addictive and mm. cannabis is being used a lot to um, overcome, for example, the opioid crisis in the US. So to take people away from some of these much more addictive products as a, a co-medicine, a medicine that they would take at the same time and then reduce their reliance on the addictive yeah. medicines. Interesting, yeah. I hope that uh, answers the question, Amna. If not, yeah, just let us know. Uh, Annabelle mentions something probably from the previous slide about soft capsules. Not entirely sure what the question is. I'm gonna say yeah. yes. Thank Are we you. gonna make soft capsules? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably. So soft yes. capsules is a dosage form that absolutely you could make with medicinal cannabis. Okay. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question as well. Um, Sarah asks, um, do you have engineering uh, an engineering program at Helios to produce ideal uh, phenotypes mm -hmm. with desired concentration or ratio? of specific actives? We do. So we have at Helios a breeding and genetics program um, where we're looking at targeting specific cannabinoids or cannabinoid profiles in the genetic. We also target a number of other things around, for example, pest resistance in the plant, as well as some of the yield and potency attributes that we're looking for. Um, and we have some research partnerships there as well. So that's that's um, definitely an area of research for us at, at Helios. Perfect. Thank you, Carmen. And I hope that answers your question, Sarah. Uh, let's continue with the presentation. There are only a few slides left. We also have nine minutes left in the webinar. Uh, so yeah, uh, feel free to ask, continue ask questions. And Carmen, maybe you can explain a little yes. bit about this market growth. It's, um, it's great to see the questions come through. Like I said, one of our values is curious, so happy to answer any questions that, that do come through. Um, I guess the key message around market size is it's growing and it's growing very quickly. Uh, the global market growth of around 60 billion New Zealand dollars by 2025. So that's um, just under say 40 billion euros 
uh, for those that are trying frantically to translate what that is. But for us, the exciting thing is that growth rate that we see of over 20%. And we've spoken about some of these markets already. So um, let me help you as well with the translation. So the, the global total addressable market is estimated to be over 18 billion New Zealand dollars um, or around 12 billion euros. And you can see Germany takes up a big part of that. Uh, and that is one of our early target markets for us at Helios. That will be one of our first export markets. Uh, in New Zealand, if you look relative numbers, we're relatively small, but we're keen to look after the Kiwi patients. Um, this is home for us and we want to look after. And actually one of our larger investors says that the reason he is invested in Helios is because he thinks that everyone should have the right to a pain-free existence, which is quite a compelling reason to be part of this journey. Um, Australia as well is growing. Their scheme is similar, but slightly different to ours in New Zealand. So, so is G Germany, I think you mentioned, is, is right now the biggest market in the world? It uh, is. It's the biggest medicinal cannabis market in the world. So, so uh, what, what's the reason? Because the difference, uh, Israel is the second biggest. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, yes. There's a huge difference between the two. Any idea why that might be? Yeah, so Germany has a couple of years head start. Um, mm -hmm. It was the, this, the medicinal cannabis was legalized in Germany in 2017. Um, but also in the German market, there is a high percentage which is covered by health insurance. And that is the real mm -hmm. key driver is because in Germany, their health insurance also covers medicinal cannabis. Any chances that might happen also in New Zealand at some point, or what, what's your idea? Yep. So um, our first products that we've brought to market, we've brought on under the medicinal cannabis scheme. Uh, so that means that they are launched without having clinical data to support them. But as part of our pathway at Helios and what we're committed to do is clinical trials to support uh, the, the promise and the goal of safe and efficacious medicines. And I think that as we see those clinical trials coming through, that we will see some of those conversations shift around funding models um, in New Zealand as well. Mm. Is that also the trend worldwide? Um, what, not, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, not necessarily. So okay. um, in New Zealand, we've set very high standards for ourselves and have taken the medicinal route around products. Uh, in different parts of the world, there is a much more recreational part. And for example, Germany is uh, moving towards a recreational market as well after the last election there. So in some areas, they've started more medicinal and moved more recreational. Israel, interestingly, has done differently. So they've done the opposite. They started more recreational and then they brought in the requirements for GMP manufacturing to make sure that they're getting that consistency and high standard. So our high standards in, the New, in New Zealand mean that we can uh, export to a number of these countries. Um, plus there are markets opening all the time. It's still, even 2017, I say there are a few years ahead of us and regulations are still not that long ago, um, but we are seeing more and more markets open up all the time. Companies like France doing trial schemes, uh, Thailand having a local, medicinal cannabis market for domestic producers starting to open up. So it'll be interesting to see how the world continues to evolve in medicinal cannabis and, and what other countries follow the lead. Mm -hmm. uh, tying into that, I see a, a question coming in uh, from Kay. Um, well, a few actually. I imagine that you have received invitations from the big pharmaceutical companies to get to know your product or not yet? So um, we're probably a bit early at Helios, um, but if I talk about the big pharma or, or at least mid-sized pharma entering the market, so Jazz Pharmaceuticals in Ireland bought GW Pharmaceuticals, which was a, which is a medicinal cannabis company, one of the early ones for 7 billion euros last year. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Reddy in India has just acquired Nimbus Health in Germany. And so we're seeing a number of uh, 
pharmaceutical companies entering into this market through either partnerships or acquisitions. And I think that will continue. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Huh. Um, then the, uh, another question, do you consider that your product can somehow affect the current pharmaceutical market? So I think um, I don't see it as a competing thing. I'm not, I guess, because I come from a pharmaceutical background, I'm very much of the idea that you should be working with your healthcare professional to have the right medicine for you. Um, I think that the learning about medicinal cannabis uh, can absolutely support a number of the approaches that people are taking in medicine. And for some people, it's, it's the right thing to use. But And I think that we're seeing some of the disruption of the pharmaceutical market, not necessarily from medicinal cannabis, but around natural health and people understanding overall whole body wellness a lot more compared mm -hmm. to a traditional symptom and prescription approach. Okay, and, and then maybe a last question to finish this slide. What is the opinion of the OMS and normal medicine about your products? The OMS? Yeah, I'm also doubting what OMS would mean. AF, can you help us with that acronym? But uh, yeah, otherwise we will come back to this uh, later because we have to be careful with time. time. So let's move on to the next slide. Sure. Um, so a couple of the things that are driving this market growth, uh, World Health Organization. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I can answer, answer that question. So under the World Health Organization, then that's what has required um, countries around the world that are going to legalize medicinal cannabis to have their own medicinal cannabis scheme. It sits separately to the other medicine schemes. So there is consideration for this in their approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Ah, you're very welcome. <laughs> and um, here are some of the reasons that we see that global market growth. And we've spoken a little bit about this. So this idea of natural medicines, this idea of preventative health care or understanding how people can proactively manage their health or be part of those decisions. Uh, a lot of, in New Zealand, we, we know a lot of our patients are doing their own research into medicinal cannabis. And then doctors are being asked questions. And actually the doctors are coming to us and saying, I am being asked by my patients and I want to help them, but as part of my duty of care, I need to understand what I'm prescribing. So it's actually very much self-directed or patient-driven um, in these early stages. And it's great to see the doctors wanting to learn more about it to be able to support their patients. Thank you. Yeah, so then we come to the last uh, slide, uh, which is, I think, quite interesting also regarding licenses. So please go ahead, Carmen. I do have a few questions about these uh, yeah. later. So Helios holds a GMP license to manufacture medicines, which was issued in July of last year. And mm -hmm. as we spoke about earlier, that was issued by MedSafe, which is part of our New Zealand Ministry of Health. Um, we also hold medicinal cannabis licenses. So we're covered by two different licensing regimes. And the medicinal cannabis licenses are very much around the security of the supply chain. And so that complements the GMP license, but does mean we have a few more audits than a standard medicine. Um, a lot of the things that we're looking at under the medicinal cannabis license are very similar to those people who are making controlled drugs. So protecting the flow of the product under very similar to controlled drug regulations. Um, and the third part that's not listed on the slide, but the third part to bring medicines to market is obviously the product registration in New Zealand or in the country that it's going into and meeting the regulations as part of that product registration process. Okay. So and, and you're, you're doing something quite new. How hard is it to really get GMP certified? Maybe you can explain a little bit how you went through this, the, the, the putting in place this quality management system also uh, mm -hmm. within Helios uh, to get GMP uh, compliant. Yep. So our GMP system is based on the same pillars as everyone else that mm -hmm. we're all very yeah, familiar sure. with. Yeah. Um, where we had some early stumbling was uh, just getting overwhelmed by paper 
and I guess one of my bugbears that I've been brought in to fix plenty of times as a consultant is when someone says that they have thousands and thousands of SOPs and no one reads them or they can't find the document that they need. And so being able to go digital quite early um, mm -hmm. has helped us be able to go quickly. Um, and SciLife is obviously part of that, um, but also bringing together the pharmaceutical expertise with people who come from different companies. Um, sometimes that causes challenges because we have some different ways to do things, but it actually lets us put all of the ideas out there and then choose the best way for Helios as well. All right. So yeah, we had um, the Q&A session in the middle somehow. Uh, so I thought it was interesting uh, to, to do it like this way today. Uh, to make sure that the questions were related to what you were explaining. So that's that's perfect. Mm -hmm. We are uh, three minutes over time already. So I want to be respect, uh, respective of everybody's time. Uh, there are a few questions left to answer. Um, what we will do is we will just uh, make sure that these um, are answered over email. So you have your answers from Carmen. We will reach out to Carmen. Thank you very much, Carmen, from be for being here. A very interesting journey. Very interesting explanation. Um, uh, yeah, and I hope to see you uh, in the future with maybe other talks and other explanations. I'm very curious to follow how Helios is going to uh, grow over time. So thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for all the uh, attendees for your questions and hope to see you in the next webinar. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>